Part Four of My Hunt After the Captain by Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I put the question in a quiet, friendly way to several of the prisoners what they were fighting for. One answered, For our homes. Two or three others said they did not know, and manifested great indifference to the whole matter, at which another of their number, a sturdy fellow, took offence and muttered opinions strongly derogatory to those who would not stand up for the cause they had been fighting for a feeble attenuated old man who wore the rebel uniform if such it could be called stood by without showing any sign of intelligence it was cutting very close to the bone to carve such a shred of humanity from the body politic to make a soldier of we were just leaving when a face attracted me and i stopped the party that is the true southern type i said to my companion a young fellow a little over twenty rather tall slight with a perfectly smooth boyish cheek delicate somewhat high features and a fine almost feminine mouth stood at the opening of his tent and as we turned towards him fidgeted a little nervously with one hand at the loose canvas while he seemed at the same time not unwilling to talk he was from mississippi he said had been at georgetown college and was so far imbued with letters that even the name of the literary humility before him was not new to his ears of course i found it easy to come into magnetic relation with him and to ask him without incivility what he was fighting for because i like the excitement of it he answered i know those fighters with women's mouths and boys cheeks one such from the circle of my own friends sixteen years old slipped away from his nursery and dashed in under an assumed name among the red-legged zouaves in whose company he got an ornamental bullet mark in one of the earliest conflicts of the war did you ever see a genuine yankee said my philadelphia friend to the young mississippian i have shot at a good many of them he replied modestly his woman's mouth stirring a little with a pleasant dangerous smile the dutch captain here put his foot into the conversation as his ancestors used to put theirs into the scale when they were buying furs of the indians by weight so much for the weight of a hand so much for the weight of a foot it deranged the balance of our intercourse there was no use in throwing a fly where a paving stone had just splashed into the water and i nodded a good-bye to the boy fighter thinking how much pleasanter it was for my friend the captain to address him with unanswerable arguments and crushing statements in his own tent than it would be to meet him upon some remote picket station and offer his fair proportions to the quick eye of a youngster who would draw a bead on him before he had time to say dunder and blixem we drove back to the town no message after dinner still no message dr cuyler chief army hospital inspector is in town they say let us hunt him up perhaps he can help us we found him at the jones house a gentleman of large proportions but of lively temperament his frame knit in the north i think but ripened in georgia incisive prompt but good-humoured wearing his broad-brimmed steeple-crowned felt hat with the least possible tilt on one side a sure sign of exuberant vitality in a mature and dignified person like him business-like in his ways and not to be interrupted while occupied with another but giving himself up heartily to the claimant who held him for the time he was so genial so cordial so encouraging that it seemed as if the clouds which had been thick all the morning broke away as we came into his presence and the sunshine of his large nature filled the air all around us he took the matter in hand at once as if it were his own private affair in ten minutes he had a second telegraphic message on its way to mrs k at hagerstown sent through the government channel from the state capital 
one so direct and urgent that I should be sure of an answer to it, whatever became of the one I had sent in the morning. While this was going on, we hired a dilapidated barouche, driven by an odd young native, neither boy nor man, as a codling when tis almost an apple, who said wary for very, simple and sincere, who smiled faintly at our pleasantries, always with a certain reserve of suspicion, and a gleam of the shrewdness that all men get who live in the atmosphere of horses. He drove us round by the capital grounds, white with tents, which were disgraced in my eyes by unsoldierly scrawls in huge letters, thus, the seven Bloomsbury brothers, Devil's Hole, and similar inscriptions. Then to the Beacon Street of Harrisburg, which looks upon the Susquehanna instead of the common, and shows a long front of handsome houses with fair gardens. The river is pretty nearly a mile across here, but very shallow now. The codling told us that a rebel spy had been caught trying its fords a little while ago, and was now at Camp Curtin with a heavy ball chained to his leg. A popular story, but a lie, Dr. Wilson said. A little farther along we came to the barkless stump of the tree to which Mr. Harris, the Seacrops of the city, named after him, was tied by the Indians for some unpleasant operation of scalping or roasting when he was rescued by friendly savages who paddled across the stream to save him. Our youngling pointed out a very respectable-looking stone house as having been built by the Indians about those times. Guides have queer notions occasionally. I was at Niagara just when Dr. Ray arrived there with his companions and dogs and things from his Arctic search after the lost navigator. Who are those? I said to my conductor. Them? he answered. Them's the men that went out west, out to Michigan after Sir Ben Franklin. Of the other sites of Harrisburg, the Brandt House, or Hotel, or whatever it is called, seems most worth notice. Its façade is imposing, with a row of stately columns high above which a broad sign impends like a crag over the brow of a lofty precipice. The lower floor only appeared to be open to the public. Its tessellated pavement and ample courts suggested the idea of a temple where great multitudes might kneel uncrowded at their devotions. But from appearances about the place where the altar should be, I judged that if one asked the officiating priest for the cup which cheers and likewise inebriates, his prayer would not be unanswered. The edifice recalled to me a similar phenomenon I had once looked upon, the famous Café Pedrocci at Padua. It was the same thing in Italy and America. A rich man builds himself a mausoleum and calls it a place of entertainment. The fragrance of innumerable libations and the smoke of incense-breathing cigars and pipes shall ascend day and night through the arches of his funereal monument. What are the poor dips which flare and flicker on the crowns of spikes that stand at the corners of St. Genevieve's filigreed case sarcophagus to this perpetual offering of sacrifice? Ten o'clock in the evening was approaching. The telegraph office would presently close, and as yet there were no tidings from Hagerstown. Let us step over and see for ourselves. A message! A message! Captain H. still here, leaves seven tomorrow for Harrisburg Penna, is doing well, Mrs. H. K. A note from Dr. Kyler to the same effect came soon afterwards to the hotel. We shall sleep well to-night, but let us sit a while with nubiferous, or, if we may coin a word, nephiligenous accompaniment, such as shall gently narcotize the over-wearied brain, and fold its convolutions for slumber like the leaves of a lily at nightfall. For now the over-tense nerves are all unstraining themselves, and a buzz, like that which comes over one who stops after being long jolted upon an uneasy pavement, makes the whole frame alive with a luxurious, languid sense of all its inmost fibres. Our cheerfulness ran over, and the mild, pensive clerk 
was so magnetized by it that he came and sat down with us. He presently confided to me, with infinite naivete and ingenuousness, that, judging from my personal appearance, he should not have thought me the writer that he in his generosity reckoned me to be. His conception, so far as I could reach it, involved a huge uplifted forehead embossed with protuberant organs of the intellectual faculties such as all writers are supposed to possess in a bounding measure while i fell short of his ideal in this respect he was pleased to say that he found me by no means the remote and inaccessible personage he had imagined and that i had nothing of the dandy about me which last compliment i had a modest consciousness of most abundantly deserving sweet slumbers brought us to the morning of thursday the train from hagerstown was due at eleven fifteen a m we took another ride behind the codling who showed us the sights of yesterday over again being in a gracious mood of mind i enlarged on the varying aspects of the town pumps and other striking objects which we had once inspected as seen by the different lights of evening and morning after this we visited the schoolhouse hospital a fine young fellow whose arm had been shattered was just falling into the spasms of lockjaw the beads of sweat stood large and round on his flushed and contracted features he was under the effect of opiates why not if his case was desperate as it seemed to be considered stop his sufferings with chloroform it was suggested that it might shorten life what then i said are a dozen additional spasms worth living for the time approached for the train to arrive from hagerstown and we went to the station i was struck while waiting there with what seemed to me a great want of care for the safety of the people standing round just after my companion and myself had stepped off the track i noticed a car coming quietly along at a walk as one may say without engine without visible conductor without any person heralding its approach so silently so insidiously that i could not help thinking how very near it came to flattening out me in my match-box worse than the revel pantomimist and his snuff-box were flattened out in the play the train was late fifteen minutes half an hour late and i began to get nervous lest something had happened while i was looking for it out started a freight train as if on purpose to meet the cars i was expecting for a grand smash-up i shivered at the thought and asked an employee of the road with whom i had formed an acquaintance a few minutes old why there should not be a collision of the expected train with this which was just going out he smiled an official smile and answered that they arranged to prevent that or words to that effect Twenty-four hours had not passed from that moment when a collision did occur, just out of the city, where I feared it, by which at least eleven persons were killed, and from forty to sixty more were maimed and crippled. Today there was the delay spoken of, but nothing worse. The expected train came in so quietly that I was almost startled to see it on the track. Let us walk calmly through the cars and look around us in the first car on the fourth seat to the right i saw my captain there saw i him even my first-born whom i had sought through many cities how are you boy how are you dad such are the proprieties of life as they are observed among us anglo-saxons of the nineteenth century decently disguising those natural impulses that made joseph the prime minister of egypt weep aloud so that the egyptians and the house of pharaoh heard nay which had once overcome his shaggy old uncle esau so entirely that he fell on his brother's neck and cried like a baby in the presence of all the women but the hidden cisterns of the soul may be filling fast with sweet tears while the windows through which it looks are undimmed by a drop or a film of moisture 
These are times in which we cannot live solely for selfish joys or griefs. I had not let fall the hand I held when a sad, calm voice addressed me by name. I fear that at the moment I was too much absorbed in my own feelings, for certainly, at any other time, I should have yielded myself without stint to the sympathy which this meeting might well call forth. You remember my son, Cortland Saunders, whom I brought to see you once in Boston? Oh, I do remember him well. He was killed on Monday at Shepherdstown. I am carrying his body back with me on this train. He was my only child. If you could come to my house, I can hardly call it my home now, it would be a pleasure to me. This young man, belonging in Philadelphia, was the author of A New System of Latin Paradigms, a work showing extraordinary scholarship and capacity. It was this book which first made me acquainted with him, and I kept him in my memory, for there was genius in the youth. Some time afterwards he came to me with a modest request to be introduced to President Felton, and one or two others, who would aid him in a course of independent study he was proposing to himself. I was most happy to smooth the way for him, and he came repeatedly after this to see me and express his satisfaction in the opportunities for study he enjoyed at Cambridge. He was a dark, still slender person always with a trance-like remoteness a mystic dreaminess of manner such as i never saw in any other youth whether he heard with difficulty or whether his mind reacted slowly on an alien thought i could not say but his answer would often be behind time and then a vague sweet smile or a few words spoken under his breath as if he had been trained in sick men's chambers. For such a young man, seemingly destined for the inner life of contemplation, to be a soldier seemed almost unnatural. Yet he spoke to me of his intention to offer himself to his country, and his blood must now be reckoned among the precious sacrifices which will make her soil sacred for ever. Had he lived, I doubt not that he would have redeemed the rare promise of his earlier years. He has done better, for he has died that unborn generations may attain the hopes held out to our nation and to mankind. So then I had been within ten miles of the place where my wounded soldier was lying, and then calmly turned my back upon him to come once more round by a journey of three or four hundred miles to the same region I had left. No mysterious attraction warned me that the heart, warm with the same blood as mine, was throbbing so near my own. I thought of that lovely, tender passage where Gabriel glides unconsciously by Evangeline upon the great river. Ah, me, if that railroad crash had been a few hours earlier, we, too, should never have met again after coming so close to one another. The source of my repeated disappointments was soon made clear enough. The captain had gone to Hagerstown, intending to take the cars at once for Philadelphia, as his three friends actually did, and as I took it for granted he certainly would. But as he walked languidly along, some ladies saw him across the street, and seeing were moved with pity, and pitying spoke such soft words that he was tempted to accept their invitation and rest a while beneath their hospitable roof. The mansion was old, as the dwellings of gentlefolks should be. The ladies were some of them young, and all were full of kindness. There were gentle cares, and unasked luxuries, and pleasant talk, and music sprinkling from the piano, with a sweet voice to keep them company, and all this after the swamps of the Chickahominy, the mud and flies of Harrison's Landing, the dragging marches, the desperate battles, the fretting wound, the jolting ambulance, the log house, and the rickety milk cart. Thanks, uncounted thanks, to the angelic ladies 
whose charming attentions detained him from saturday to thursday to his great advantage and to my infinite bewilderment as for his wound how could it do otherwise than well under such hands the bullet had gone smoothly through dodging everything but a few nervous branches which would come right in time and leave him as well as ever at ten that evening we were in philadelphia the captain at the house of the friends so often referred to and i the guest of charlie my kind companion the quaker element gives an irresistible attraction to these benignant philadelphia households many things reminded me that i was no longer in the land of the pilgrims on the table were kula sla and schmier kaz but the good grandmother who dispensed with such quiet simple grace these and more familiar delicacies was literally ignorant of baked beans and asked if it was the lima bean which was employed in that marvellous dish of animalized leguminous farina charlie was pleased with my comparing the face of the small ethiop known to his household as tines to a huckleberry with features he also approved my parallel between a certain german blonde young maiden whom we passed in the street and the morris white peach but he was so good-humoured at times that if one scratched a lucifer he accepted it as an illumination a day in philadelphia left a very agreeable impression of the outside of that great city which has endeared itself so much of late to all the country by its most noble and generous care of our soldiers measured by its sovereign hotel the continental it would stand at the head of our economic civilization it provides for the comforts and conveniences and many of the elegances of life more satisfactorily than any american city perhaps than any other city anywhere many of its characteristics are accounted for to some extent by its geographical position it is the great neutral centre of the continent where the fiery enthusiasms of the south and the keen fanaticisms of the north meet at their outer limits and result in a compound which neither turns litmus red nor turmeric brown it lives largely on its traditions of which leaving out franklin and independence hall the most imposing must be considered its famous waterworks in my younger days i visited fairmont and it was with a pious reverence that i renewed my pilgrimage to that perennial fountain its watery ventricles were throbbing with the same systole and diastole as when the blood of twenty years bounding in my own heart i looked upon their giant mechanism but in the place of pratt's garden was an open park and the old house where robert morris held his court in a former generation was changing to a public restaurant a suspension bridge cobwebbed itself across the schuylkill where that audacious arch used to leap the river at a single bound an arch of greater span as they love to tell us than was ever before constructed the upper ferry bridge was to the schuylkill what the colossus was to the harbour of Rhodes. it had an air of dash about it which went far towards redeeming the dead level of respectable average which flattens the physiognomy of the rectangular city philadelphia will never be herself again until another robert mills and another lewis wormwig have shaped her a new palladium she must leap the schuylkill again or old men will sadly shake their heads like the jews at the site of the second temple remembering the glories of that which it replaced there are times when ethiopian minstrelsy can amuse if it does not charm a weary soul and such a vacant hour there was on this same friday evening the opera house was spacious and admirably ventilated as i was listening to the merriment of the sooty buffoons i happened to cast my eyes up to the ceiling and through an open semicircular window a bright solitary star looked me calmly in the eye it was a strange intrusion of the vast eternities beckoning from the infinite spaces 
I called the attention of one of my neighbors to it, but Bones was irresistibly droll, and Arcturus or Aldebaran, or whatever the blazing luminary may have been, with all his revolving worlds, sailed uncared for down the firmament. On Saturday morning we took up our line of march for New York. Mr. Felton, president of the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad, had already called upon me, with a benevolent and sagacious look on his face, which implied that he knew how to do me a service, and meant to do it. Sure enough, when we got to the depot, we found a couch spread for the captain, and both of us were passed on to New York with no visits but those of civility from the conductor. The best thing I saw on the route was a rustic fence, near Elizabethtown, I think, but I'm not quite sure. There was more genius in it than in any structure of the kind I have ever seen, each length being of a special pattern, ramified, reticulated, contorted, as the limbs of the trees had grown. I trust some friend will photograph or stereograph this fence for me, to go with the view of the spires of Frederick already referred to as mementos of my journey. I had come to feeling that I knew most of the respectably dressed people whom I met in the cars, and had been in contact with them at some time or other. Three or four ladies and gentlemen were near us, forming a group by themselves. Presently one addressed me by name, and on inquiry, I found him to be the gentleman who was with me in the pulpit as orator on the occasion of another Phi Beta Kappa poem, one delivered at New Haven. The party were very courteous and friendly, and contributed in various ways to our comfort. It sometimes seems to me as if there were only about a thousand people in the world who keep going round and round behind the scenes and then before them, like the army in a beggarly stage show. Suppose that I should really wish, some time or other, to get away from this everlasting circle of revolving supernumeraries. Where should I buy a ticket, the like of which was not in some of their pockets, or find a seat to which some one of them was not a neighbor? A little less than a year before, after the Ball's Bluff accident, the captain, then the lieutenant, and myself, had reposed for a night on our homeward journey at the Fifth Avenue Hotel, where we were lodged on the ground floor and fared sumptuously. We were not so peculiarly fortunate this time, the house being really very full. Farther from the flowers and nearer to the stars, to reach the neighborhood of which last, the per ardua of three or four flights of stairs was formidable for any mortal wounded or well. The vertical railway settled that for us, however. It is a giant corkscrew forever pulling a mammoth cork, which by some divine judgment is no sooner drawn than it is replaced in its position. This ascending and descending stopper is hollow, carpeted with cushioned seats, and is watched over by two condemned souls, called conductors, one of whom is said to be named Igion, and the other Sisyphus. I love New York, because, as in Paris, everybody that lives in it feels that it is his property, at least as much as it is anybody's. My Broadway, in particular, I love almost as I used to love my boulevards. I went, therefore, with peculiar interest, on the day that we rested at our grand hotel, to visit some new pleasure-grounds the citizens had been arranging for us, and which I had not yet seen. The Central Park is an expanse of wild country, well crumpled so as to form ridges which will give views and hollows that will hold water. The hips and elbows and other bones of nature stick out here and there, in the shape of rocks which give character to the scenery, and an unchangeable, unpurchasable look to a landscape that without them would have been in danger of being fattened by art and money out of all its native features. The roads were fine, the sheets of water beautiful, the bridges handsome, the swans elegant in their deportment, the grass green and as short as a fast horse's winter coat. 
I could not learn whether it was kept so by clipping or singeing. I was delighted with my new property, that it cost me four dollars to get there, so far was it beyond the pillars of Hercules of the fashionable quarter. What it will be by and by depends on circumstances, but at present it is as much central to New York as Brooklyn is central to Boston. The question is not between Mr. Olmsted's admirably arranged but remote pleasure ground and our common, with its Batrachian pool, but between his eccentric park and our finest suburban scenery, between its artificial reservoirs and the broad natural sheet of Jamaica Pond. I say this not invidiously, but in justice to the beauties which surround our own metropolis. To compare the situations of any dwellings in either of the great cities, with those which look upon the common, the public garden, the waters of the back bay, would be to take an unfair advantage of Fifth Avenue and Walnut Street. St. Botolph's daughter dresses in plainer clothes than her more stately sisters, but she wears an emerald on her right hand and a diamond on her left that Sibylle herself need not be ashamed of. On Monday morning, the 29th of September, we took the cars for home, vacant lots with Irish and pigs, vegetable gardens, straggling houses, the high bridge, villages not enchanting, then Stamford, then Norwalk. Here, on the 6th of May, 1853, I passed close on the heels of the great disaster. But that my eyelids were heavy on that morning, my readers would probably have had no further trouble with me. Two of my friends saw the car in which they rode break in the middle and leave them hanging over the abyss. From Norwalk to Boston, that day's journey of two hundred miles was a long funeral procession. Bridgeport, waiting for Iranistan to rise from its ashes with all its phoenix egg domes, bubbles of wealth that broke, ready to be blown again, iridescent as ever, which is pleasant, for the world likes cheerful Mr. Barnum's success, New Haven, girt with flat marshes that look like monstrous billiard tables with haycocks lying about for balls, romantic with West Rock and its legends, cursed with a detestable depot, whose niggardly arrangements crowd the track so murderously close to the wall that the pene forte et dare must be the frequent penalty of an innocent walk on its platform, with its neat carriages, metropolitan hotels, precious old college dormitories, its vistas of elms and its dishevelled weeping willows. Hartford, substantial, well-bridged, many-steepled city, every conical spire an extinguisher of some nineteenth-century heresy, so onward, by and across the broad, shallow Connecticut, dull red road and dark river woven in like warp and woof by the shuttle of the darting engine, then Springfield, the wide-meadowed, well-feeding, horse-loving, hot-summered, giant-treed town, city among villages, village among cities, Worcester with its Dedalian labyrinth of crossing railroad bars, where the snorting minotaurs, breathing fire and smoke and hot vapours, are stabled in their dens. Framingham, fair cup-bearer, leaf-cinctured Hebe of the deep-bosomed queen sitting by the seaside on the throne of the six nations. And now I begin to know the road, not by towns, but by single dwellings, not by miles, but by rods. The poles of the great magnet that draws in all the iron tracks through the grooves of all the mountains must be near at hand, for here are crossings and sudden stops and screams of alarmed engines heard all around. The tall granite obelisk comes into view far away on the left, its beveled capstone sharp against the sky. The lofty chimneys of Charleston and East Cambridge flaunt their smoky banners up in the thin air, and now one fair bosom of the three-pilled city, with its dome-crowned summit, 
reveals itself as when many-breasted Ephesian Artemis appeared with half-open clamus before her worshippers. Fling open the window-blinds of the chamber that looks out on the waters and towards the western sun. Let the joyous light shine in upon the pictures that hang upon its walls and the shelves thick-set with the names of poets and philosophers and sacred teachers, in whose pages our boys learn that life is noble only when it is held cheap by the side of honor and duty. Lay him in his own bed, and let him sleep off his aches and weariness. So comes down another night over this household, unbroken by any messenger of evil tidings, a night of peaceful rest and grateful thoughts. For this our son and brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. End of Part 4 End of My Hunt After the Captain by Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr.